Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us today for Congresswoman Norma Torres' listening session on uh, transportation and the economy. We're eager uh, to hear your concerns tonight um, and have a, a, a series of local experts on the line uh, to give their input on, on the economic and transportation outlook for our region. Um, and we're eager to obviously get to all your questions um, at, during the Q&A portion. Uh, before we get started here, I do want to just go over a few ha housekeeping items to make sure everyone has a smooth webinar experience. Uh, if for any reason you get disconnected uh, during the call, feel free to just jump back into the email invitation that you should have received um, and log back into the call. Uh, you shouldn't have any issue with that. If for any reason you do have a question throughout the webinar, uh, feel free to either raise your virtual hand or uh, submit that to the Q&A portion on the right-hand side of the screen, and we'll get to as many questions as we can in the time allotted. But of course, if we don't get to any um, before the end of the webinar, feel free to contact our office. We'll have our information up at the end, and you can get your question answered through there. Um, so with that, um, I do want to introduce the guests that are on our call tonight um, real quickly. Um, we do have Congresswoman Norma Torres. Uh, we have Dr. Jerry Nicholsberg of UCLA's Anderson Forecast, um, who's kind of our chief economist on the call today. Uh, we have Dr. Henry Shannon of Chafee College. Uh, we have David Libatique of the Port of Los Angeles. Uh, we have Lance Hastings of the California Manufacturers and Technology Association. Uh, we have Dr. Angelo Farouk. Uh, the chair of the California Workforce Development Board, as well as his colleague, Tim Rainey, who is the executive director of the California Workforce Development Board. Um, we have Stephanie Wiggins, the CEO of Metrolink, uh, Doran Barnes, the CEO of Foothill Transit, um, Stan Stossel um, of IBW Local 47. Um, and last but certainly not least, we have Jimmy Elrod uh, of the Southwest Regional Council of Carpenters. So we have a great panel today. Um, and to get us started, I do wanna turn it over to Congresswoman Norma Torres. Great, um, thank you, Jacob, and good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining me tonight for our second in an ongoing series of listening sessions that I will be hosting to hear directly from Inland Empire residents about the challenges facing our community as we fight to overcome this virus and rebuild our way of life in 2021. Tonight, I'm hoping to hear about your unique and vital perspectives. What's going on well? What needs changing? What challenges are you facing? And what solutions um, you want uh, to see? The topics we discuss tonight will be the priorities that I will be focused on in the next Congress. But let's start things off. Um, let's acknowledge that this pandemic is more than a threat to our health and our families. It has left our economy at a standstill. Small businesses are struggling to stay afloat and workers across our region are struggling to make ends meet. As a member of the House Appropriations Committee, I've been working on parts of this bill. I like to say nothing is final until it's final, but here's what I'm expecting right now for the COVID aid package. Another round of a stimulus uh, checks, though not as much as the last time. An extension of unemployment insurance benefits, including for additional supplemental payment for gig workers, which is something that I fought for uh, from the very beginning. An extension to the Paycheck Protection Program to support small businesses and funding for vaccine distribution and support for frontline healthcare workers. Again, nothing is certain until I read the final bill and vote on it. It is always difficult to wait when we are this close, but these final hours of negotiation are vital to getting the support we need to get the bill through Congress and on the president's desk for a signature. To be clear, successfully rebuilding in 2021 requires more than congressional relief. It requires proper planning right now. We need to take advantage of low interest rates. It's cheap to borrow money right now. So now is a time to make big infrastructure investments. We have, been, we have seven major freeways, three freight and commuter rails running through the San Gabriel Valley to the Inland Empire. We also have Metro uh, commuter trains the Gold Line light rail, Metro, Omni, and Foothill Transit buses as well. 
we are a community on the move and we cannot wait until this pandemic is behind us to start planning for future investments. I introduced a provision directing Treasury to borrow money during times of recession and put money towards the Highway Trust Fund. That translates into jobs and critical infrastructure investments in our community right now when times are tough. It is also why I introduced a bill authorizing $150 million to invest in transit-oriented development, which ensures affordable housing developments are planned near public transportation options that residents rely on. Last but not least, we need to match the workforce that we have with the quality jobs that are hiring. Many people in our community are getting by cobbling together two or three jobs, jobs that don't provide benefits or retirement plans. So our challenge to solve, to solve this is how do we help them uh, get the skills and the education that they need to land the jobs and the financial security that they deserve. Here in the Illinois Empire, we have incredible apprenticeship programs and opportunities available to our young people. And we will hear more about them tonight. In Washington, I introduced legislation requiring the Department of Labor to run pilot programs, much like what we see at Intech and at Cal Poly Pomona. And I was honored to host a former labor secretary at the Intech Center so they can see for themselves how things are working in the Inland Empire. The fact is COVID will have lasting impacts on our job market, just as it will all around the world. We don't know exactly what the long-term effects will be, but we know that we need to be resilient. And that is why our conversation tonight is so important. I want to thank all, again, all of our participants tonight. You can also reach our office directly at taurus.house.gov or call 909-481-6474. To date, I've announced nearly $260 million in COVID relief for the Illinois Empire ranging from small business support to housing grants, to medical investments, to help get reliable tests out across our community. Don't hesitate to call our office to find out about the support that's available for you right now. And with that said, let's get this listening session underway. Great, thank you so much for that update, Congresswoman. Um, first up on our agenda today, we do have uh, Dr. Jerry Nicholsberg, uh, the director of the UCLA Anderson Forecast, and he's going to give us a quick update on what he's seeing as an economist and you know what we can expect moving forward in terms of our economic outlook. Dr. Nicholsberg. Thank you, Jacob, and thank you, Congresswoman Torres. Uh, I only have a few minutes because I know we want to get to your questions. Uh, so let me make just a couple of points. Uh, the first is that this is a recession like none other in our lifetime. Usually recessions happen when there's overbuilding of automobiles or homes or computers. And so there's a drawback in demand. In this time, we have a drawback in demand that is specifically public health policy and in order to fight uh, this pandemic. And that means that sectors that normally contract like logistics and manufacturing uh, and construction that are so important in the Inland Empire are not contracting in the way they do in uh, normal recessions. Uh, but those human contact sectors such as leisure and hospitality and brick and mortar retail have contracted dramatically. So that really impacts the way in which we're gonna grow in the uh, coming expansion. Uh, the second is there's a lot of discussion about is California killing off its economy by having uh, these restrictive policies, what are called uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions. All of the evidence that we have, uh, and this is evidence that comes from the 1918, 1919 influenza pandemic, suggests that the answer is absolutely not, that 
uh, that localities, cities, states that have more aggressive non-pharmaceutical interventions have better health outcomes, which is something we all hope for, but also better economic outcomes. So though California has a higher unemployment rate than uh, most of the rest of the country, that does not mean that things are gloomy for California. It may be just the opposite. So let me stop there so we can uh, move on to our other uh, panelists and our questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nicholsberg, for uh, that update. Uh, moving forward, uh, we have Dr. Henry Shannon, uh, Superintendent and President of Chafee College, who's going to talk a little bit about the workforce development programs um, that they have for high school and college students and, you know, what they're doing to, to improve the, the workforce development in our region. Dr. Thank Dr. you, Jacob. And well, welcome again, uh, Congresswoman Torres. You've done a great support of Chafee College and our region and the Intex Center. So thank you for having me here on the listening session that you have provided us a chance to talk about some of the issues we're facing here as we talk about getting people back to work. In the Industrial Technical Learning Center, or INTEC, started back in 2014 as a part of the Obama administration's TAG grant. We were in the region here in California, the only one funded in that particular funding source. It gave birth to us to talk about how we can really look at our, our mission and the workforce development to talk about in the on-demand training that related back to what the business folks needed. It was designed around industry needs. And the COVID situation here uh, since this year has provided us with the opportunity. I always say you never let a crisis go to waste and we have not let this go to waste for a Chafee College. The Intex Center is located in Fontana. And uh, as you know, Chafee College has locations in Rancho Cucamonga, Tino, and Fontana. But the Intex Center is located at, at CSI. And they developed this program in conjunction with us, with other business leaders around the area. With the demand for in-sector training, we provided online and live lab, a hybrid program training model with partners. And the e-commerce and distribution centers have come to us for help. They need to have relevant skills for their employees, Subsequently, we have looked at how we can help their employees with time management, effective communication training, and project management training as well. For other employers, the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated the need to automate, automate even more, especially at the entry level. And we've looked at, at programs like industrial, electrical, and mechanical training to teach employees how to repair and maintain their new robotic equipment. If you like my wife, uh, she gets a package or two every day from Amazon. And you wanna make sure those programs that are tied to the automation is relevant, fast and efficient and gets to where you need to go. The Intech Center is also working with dislocated worker programs. One of our current students, for example, who worked in high-end a high-end restaurant, as you talk about the industry that is hard hit because of the pandemic is the restaurant and tourism industry. Well, this one particular person said to us, I'm coming to the Intex Center to get some pandemic proof job training. This person is enrolled in our program with Cal State San Bernardino in a pre-apprentice program, which prepares students to either into electrical, mechanical engineering. And the pathway there for him will be for him to get into learning about the industry as well as wraparound services provided by San Bernardino County. I'm a member of the San Bernardino County Workforce Board, and they help get people back to work with the unemployed and the enabling people to get reskilled, uh, upskilling. Uh, they even provide funds for us to help students buy textbooks as well as pay their tuition or fees. So during this COVID-19 recovery process, we anticipate more demand for relevant on-time training through the Intex Center. And uh, for example, to give you an idea, of what we're doing with respect to numbers, there have been at least 23 employers coming to us with 500 employees and 17,500 contact hours for training. Our dislocated worker program has provided training in occupational uh, machining, the pre-apprentice pathway programs over 600 hours, the pre-engineering pathway programs 200 hours, welding certification, 
with 103 students or 38,000 contact hours. And for those students in the welding program, seven out of 10 have been hired and wages starting at $18 per hour. So a very livable wage. Other important data for us has been the registered apprentice programs. We have 71 apprentice students right now, and they're working with 17 employers who are active in the empire. Uh, the High Desert Center, which is also a model for JP College. One of the things we try to do is replicate what we're doing here and the Inland Empire at the High Desert. So Victor Valley College came to us and asked us, can you help us start a intech like center? So we've helped them develop their High Desert Training Center. And they're also doing some training with uh, e-commerce uh, employers as well. So there's a great article that we'll send you uh, a link to that talks about how to upskill and reskill folks in the Inland Empire. And Chafee College is doing a big part of our mission. As you know, we, we do transfer very well, career aid very well, but workforce is a third part of our uh, stool. If you talk about having three legs of a stool, it is critical for us right now with the pandemic and hopefully this vaccine is gonna be something that'll help us. But in times of recovery, we, want, we don't wanna just stay in one place. We gotta train and educate folks so they can get meaningful jobs in the future. So that's what we're doing at the Intech Center right now. And I stand ready for questions later. Great, thank you so much uh, for that update, Dr. Shannon. Uh, moving forward, we do have uh, David Libatique, uh, the Deputy Ex Executive Director of the Port of Los Angeles. And he's gonna talk to us a little bit about um, the interplay of, of our close access to ports um, and what opportunities that, that provides for local businesses. David? Thank you, and, and thank you, Congresswoman, for hosting this listening session and for inviting me to participate. The uh, Port of Los Angeles has very close ties with your district and, and with the Inland Empire as a whole, not, not just because I'm an Ontario High School alum and uh, took many a class in my first economics class at Chafee College, but because a third of the cargo coming through the Port of Los Angeles goes to the Inland Empire. And we are tied competitively as a trading region. So the port complex is more than just a physical build here, but it's the, the roads, the railways that, that move throughout the region and connect to the warehouse clusters and that where the largest warehouse cluster being in the Inland Empire. Um, the cargo that runs through the Port of Los Angeles uh, supports one in nine jobs throughout the region. Um, we consider ourselves a, an economic engine for the region and the state. Uh, 2020 has been a year unlike uh, any other uh, that we've seen. Um, when uh, in the depths of the early onset of the pandemic, we did see a precipitous drop in cargo volumes, canceled sailings. Uh, there were concerns about whether or not the end-to-end the -end supply chain was fully functional. Um, warehouses, uh, we weren't sure whether or not warehouses were accepting cargo that was being dispatched from the port. So, um, uh, and it looked as though we were going to have a, a huge drop off in cargo volumes. And then third quarter this year, leading into uh, um, towards the end of the uh, leading into the end of the year, uh, we've seen a huge uptick in import volumes. Um, this uh, month of November, uh, the month of November, we reported uh, 889,000 TEUs. And on average, we've been averaging over 900,000 container units coming through the port, which is our uh, highest volume a run of four months in our 113 year history. It's un, unseen. Um, what we really and what we really appreciate about um, the conversation we're hosting today is, uh, you know, we spent much of 2020 dealing with keeping the supply chain running, playing what role we could in making sure that essential workers and the supply chain overall remained fluid. But it gives us that opportunity to talk about, you know, what can we do um, Policy-wise, and, and our part is a uh, 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 note in the supply chain to really lay the foundation for what the next economy should look like. And, and, and really do want to commend the work you and uh, the California delegation have done, especially in this upcoming omnibus, because we think the infrastructure spending provisions that you have been advocating for are going to be incredibly important to maintaining our competitiveness. Um, we think that uh, getting a fair share of funding. Uh, there are provisions in this omnibus that um, will, will send more money back to donor ports like LA and Long Beach out of the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund. 
we uh, see opportunities in surface trans reauthorization that we think need to be dedicated towards freight and that could really help reduce the emissions that impact those communities out in the region and the Inland Empire especially. And so coordinating infrastructure investments with climate investments and then combining that with targeted workforce investments because as we transform the goods movement sector into a cleaner zero emission goods movement sector, connecting the dots for incumbent workers um, all across the supply chain is gonna be uh, uh, is going to be critical. Finding those new jobs for them in the supply chain is going to be critical. As far as the small businesses in the region, um, we are we are taking a program we established in 2007 called Trade Connect, and what it does is it helps small businesses engage in small and medium sized businesses engage in global trade. It uh, it's difficult to jump in for the first time, and so what we do is we set up a basic course. Uh, and we have moved it virtually because obviously we are in, we are in COVID times, but we have a course called uh, Trade Connect that we provide to if you want to host uh, uh, a group of businesses to learn how to export through the Port of Los Angeles. We bring in Exim Bank, we bring in U.S. Commercial Service, uh, and we bring in uh, folks who can really help uh, small businesses identify a market, deal with documentation, um, and really make it as simple as possible for them. So. We think that could be a resource that we want to lean on more, especially going into 2021 when we want to refocus on exports um, from, from our manufacturing sector, uh, from Central Valley Ag. We, we really want to um, have a targeted campaign to uh, get those uh, sectors of the economy that have uh, really been hit hard during this pandemic to find new markets abroad. So. Uh, I, I will I will stop there and uh, happy to you know participate in the Q and A uh, and looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much for that, uh, David. Uh, we appreciate your expertise on that front. Um, next up, we do have Lance Hastings, who is the president and CEO of the California Manufacturing and Technology Association, um, and he'll be providing a brief update on um, the capacity of the manufacturing industry to be sort of that engine of economic growth. Um, into the next year and into the future. Uh, Lance? Lance, I believe you're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> no thank you, uh, Congresswoman Torres, and to your staff. I think rather genius in setting up the agenda this way because it truly is an ecosystem that makes an economy work. And hearing from the academic side in preparation for the workforce, is very important and our member California Steel Industries has done a wonderful job in the area to bring uh, skill sets into individuals that in many cases may not have that opportunity under normal circumstances. And they've been able to step up and rise up to the occasion, which is fantastic. And pre-COVID, the trained workforce was the number one concern among CMTA members. And I'm glad that we're addressing that you know, in and through the, the crisis. The other side of the equation, of course, is the supply chain side of things. And without the good works that are done at the Port of Los Angeles in Long Beach, we wouldn't even be having a discussion about manufacturing because we wouldn't be able to receive the goods and materials that we need uh, to make things. And I appreciate the comments from uh, academia earlier, identifying that uh, the service sector part of the economy is the one that's hit the hardest in California. But the manufacturing sector and its ability to keep unemployment rates very low relative to everybody else and therefore those good paying jobs at work has really been able to help sustain the economy in California. It has not been easy though. Uh, we did have to change our practices early on back in March to increase PPE um, on site, to change our processes and sometimes our practices where a, employees are next to each other, either handing a tool or a component to one another to keep that social distance. And it's our ability to do that which has kept manufacturing at about 75% capacity or more throughout this entire crisis, which is now sadly entering its most dark phase. Uh, so in those regards, uh, we've been um, you know, very happy to be part of, uh, of that discussion uh, on uh, the economic activity, because absent the contributions of the good paying jobs that manufacturing employees are making into their local coffers, we would be in a much more difficult um, situation economically. One of the things that we've been able to do as a result of the, the crisis was to establish a PPE, 
exchange for makers and consumers of PPE. We launched that initiative with the governor in June. Uh, it's doing well and our emphasis there was to identify California-based manufacturers to provide the additional PPE, whether it be a, a non-medical mask, latex gloves, sanitizers, or gowns to those in the community that need it the most. And it's a Californians for Californians effort and we've had some tremendous success with that. Um, looking forward though, uh, there are persistent issues that affect manufacturing, one of which is the affordability and reliability of energy. Uh, you know, in Southern California, we've had challenges with uh, public safety power shutoffs recently. Um, always a challenge uh, in the manufacturing sector that tends to be three shifts um, and our, uh, we don't turn out the lights at five o'clock and go home. I mean, that's essentially uh, the next shift and we're working hard 24 seven around the clock. So that, that has been one of the challenges that, that concerns me the most. But the one thing in my two, ro two years in the role at um, CMTA as its leader is that the Inland Empire has always led all regions in the state in terms of its manufacturing output and its manufacturing job profile. And it is uh, something that we are very proud of. And if we could ever uh, take all of those learnings and those dynamics that occur in the Inland Empire and export them to the other regions in the state, uh, we would be rocking and rolling, uh, certainly in the manufacturing context, if not the other context. You're uniquely situated with the two interstate highways. Uh, it's really a growth opportunity for all of us. The weather's great, and I think the opportunities are fantastic as soon as we get through uh, the pandemic. So what I'd like to do is conclude with the observation that um, addressing the COVID crisis and how we come out of it, we shouldn't be using lenses that look backward, but rather lenses that look forward because the lenses that we're looking at right now are challenged and difficult. And we really need to look forward and work together. And the fact that we have federal interest, state and local interests in these listening sessions is uh, incredible. We need more of that. And uh, I'll close with a final comment thanking uh, thanking you, Congresswoman, for the efforts in Washington. And it's a late, cold night back there, and we appreciate all that you're doing. So thanks a lot for having me part of the forum. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Hastings, for, for those comments. Um, and our last speaker for today, um, before we get uh, to the Q&A portion, where we'll bring all of our panelists in, um, is Dr. Angelo Farouk. Um, he is the chair of the California Workforce Development Board, um, and he's here to give us a little insight into um, you know, the Inland Empire economy and, and, and what, uh, what we can uh, expect looking forward for our workforce development opportunities. Dr. Farouk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jacob. And uh, uh, before I begin, I just want to express uh, appreciation for being invited and for the tremendous uh, leadership from Congresswoman Torres. So thank you. And I also just want to point out that our excellent, my colleague and executive director of our agency, Tim Rainey, is here with us and he will be fielding the Q&A portion of, uh, of this presentation. Uh, so I, I want to start by just saying that I know that typically when people think of economic downturns, it's really uh, represented a lot just about generally unemployment and that there's too few jobs. We really are facing a much deeper economic crisis because our focus is also on the job quality component. And that's right now an, an even greater crisis than even the, 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 the surface metrics that we're viewing the economy. There's not enough uh, quality good jobs for people who need them. And as Congresswoman Torres mentioned earlier, that's requiring people to wor work multiple jobs just to be able to uh, pay their basic necessities. And so uh, we know that communities or businesses, everyone can thrive when those uh, good wages and income security is there. And that's why as a state workforce board, we uh, value uh, the labor movement and often work with them hand in hand to provide partnerships, um, to support apprenticeships, and other meaningful uh, career pathways. And so the other thing is we're really trying to be intentional. We have two great local county boards. Um, I'm locally based in the Inland Empire, born and raised as well. Um, but everything we wanna do, it's important, whether it's from land use decisions or uh, other things that we're planning, not just for today, but for the sustainable economic development uh, 10 to 20 years from now uh, you know, and even beyond. Um, our governor, uh, Gavin Newsom, is a big proponent of California for all, that's the theme. And that means that regions like the Inland Empire, which typically sometimes might not have been as much uh, well represented, 
uh, are getting um, extraordinary representation. Um, and I'm obviously honored to serve the governor in this capacity as well. And so we want to, this economic recovery opportunities to be uh, possibilities of how we can uh, address inequities that have been in place uh, for a long time and economic injustices of the past. Our uh, mantra and our, our theme is about high road training partnerships and high road is defined uh, in this administration for job quality. And that means living wages, uh, health benefits, pensions, uh, and on the job uh, skills training equity, uh, which means that we want to be very deliberate and intentional about low income families and people from disadvantaged communities getting opportunities and uh, climate. We know that uh, clean air and sustainability is important for the well being of everybody. And uh, lastly, I just want to conclude by um, highlighting some specific in investments beyond our ongoing funding. Uh, that our, uh, is, our workforce system receives, um, such as uh, the $740,000 High Road Construction Careers Grant that we recently uh, awarded to the San Bernardino Community College District, which is in partnership with the Building Trades. And this is a, a, a regional effort, um, not just specific to San Bernardino, uh, for the whole Lunar Empire. Uh, and that also, you know, again, focuses on apprenticeships. Um, and then very recently, just literally a few days ago, we announced a $1.3 million high road training partnership grant uh, uh, focusing on logistics industry. It's led by the Inland Empire Labor Institute, the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, and the Warehouse Worker Resource Center. And this it means representation from many thousands of essential frontline workers in that industry. And uh, we look forward to partnering with them to, uh, again, have a, a sustainable vision of economic development uh, for the region and for the congressional district and uh, upward mobility uh, in general. So thank you so much. And uh, my colleague, Tim Rainey will be available for Q&A. Great, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Farouk for that. Um, I do want to recognize quickly the other um, panelists we have on the line who will be here um, and available for questions. Um, like Dr. Farouk said, we have Tim Rainey of the, the California Workforce Development Board. Um, we have Stephanie Wiggins, the CEO of Metrolink, Doran Barnes, the CEO of Foothill Transit, um, Stan Stossel of IBW47, and uh, Jimmy, Elrod, Jimmy Elrod of the Southwest Regional Council of Carpenters. Um, and so with that, I do wanna move it over to our question and answer session. Um, and I do wanna uh, kick it off here um, by moving towards the transportation folks that are on our line uh, today, um, Stephanie Wiggins of Metrolink and Doran Barnes of Foothill Transit, uh, just to give a little update on, on what they, they're seeing um, with their, their public transit um, organizations and, you know, how they see public trans transit as, as being um, the engine of, of economic growth uh, throughout 2021. So I'll, I'll start with Doran. Good evening. Great. Um, I think in, in terms of, of where we're going with transportation, and, and first off, Congresswoman, thank you for the opportunity to join you this evening. Um, I'm always reminded of your service on our board of directors in a past life. and really appreciate how you continue to think about public transportation going forward. I think in the world that we're, we're now living in, what we very keenly identified is that uh, public transportation and foothill transit are really providing essential trips. And many of our essential workers rely on us to get to their jobs, to get to medical care, to be able to obtain food. The, the, the COVID pandemic has really put a spotlight on that. And uh, many of the things that we're doing are quite opposite from what one might think. If you think in a traditional business sense, we're carrying about half the riders we carried before COVID occurred. We're running 100% of our service. From a true business sense, that doesn't really make sense. But from a public service standpoint, making sure that that high quality service is available has been absolutely crucial. And we've committed to continue to run 100% of our service level as long as we possibly can. The CARES Act funding helped tremendously in allowing us to achieve that. Um, many of the things that we're doing now, we think a little bit differently about. So it used to be when you saw an empty bus, that was a bad thing. Now, when you see a mostly empty bus, that's actually a good thing. Uh, it means that we're providing social distancing and it means the people that we are carrying are getting to those essential duties. As we come out of this, we need to make sure that we're continuing to provide that level of service so that not only those essential trips can occur, but other trips can come back, and that would be trips to schools, to universities, 
um, to people that are currently working at home but might be returning to jobs going forward. We've got to maintain that critical service level so we're ready to respond and support the economy. Thank you for that, Doran. And, and Ms. Wiggins, do you have anything to add to that? Sure. I, again, I appreciate Congresswoman Torres's making this form available. I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. As we look forward to 2021, um, if stimulus money should become available, we have 10 what we're calling shovel-worthy projects in uh, the 35th district that total over $270 million that would generate almost 14,000 jobs. So when I hear um, our academic community, our manufacturing community, and workforce development community talk about how they are gearing up. It's so critical because you all will recall pre-pandemic in public transportation, in construction, we were already challenged with the pipeline. And public transportation is part of the solution to helping uh, be a catalyst to stimulating our local economy. And so the fact that we have a workforce pipeline uh, being focused on is really important because we've got the important uh, projects that can do it. And why we call them shovel worthy is because we're talking about infrastructure projects that um, are job creators, help with equity, and also are good for the environment. And that's really how we've pivoted during COVID. As a commuter rail agency, we're often thought of as only uh, focused on the office worker. What we learned, as Doran mentioned, is when uh, the crisis hit, uh, we had to look at who was still riding our system. And for Metrolink, it was essential workers. And 39% of those still riding our system are in the healthcare industry. And that's an industry that we had not focused on. And so we are broadening our focus uh, to make sure we're providing that essential service for those essential workers. And we're making sure that we're ready to help put the Inland Empire back to work when stimulus funding becomes available. Thank you. Um, Stephanie, if I may um, just add a couple of uh, things here. Um, yes. As we move forward, as you move forward with those projects, um, I think it'll be critically important to um, ensure that we hire locally um, and that we connect you with the Intech Center. So if there's a need to hire new workers, um, that you know they have an opportunity to train the local workforce that we have for those great jobs that you're creating. I would love to do that. And I, I'm definitely going to um, take uh, Dr. Shannon's information. And I would love to work with your office because we will need some federal support in encouraging that local hire. But I think it's critical. And we know it works. Absolutely. Thank you. Great. Thank you, uh, Ms. Wiggins. Um, and that actually provides a great segue um, into another question um, about the workforce pipeline um, and where people can go to learn maybe more about beginning an apprenticeship um, we have um, some folks from our labor community on the line here. Um, we have Stan Stossel of IBW 47 and Jimmy Elrod of the Carpenters. So I want to give them a chance um, to speak maybe about some of these opportunities that are available to our residents for um, apprenticeships and, and things like that. Good paying jobs. So I'll kick it off to Jimmy if you want to start. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to be here um, speaking amongst uh, great panelists. Uh, thank you very much, Congresswoman, for everything you do for not just the district, but uh, our country. Um, not an easy job, right? Um, appreciate uh, everybody on this panel, um, all the hard work that, that's being done. Uh, so like Norma had just mentioned, uh, you know, hire local. Um, that is paramount. Um, I think for uh, the last you know, 20 plus years, the educational system in large part did away with vocational training. And, and that really did a disservice to uh, the workforce. And it did a disservice to industries all, all across the United States. And thankfully, you know, I, I think uh, we're back on track. Um, you know, uh, we're, we're contributing to uh, remedying the, the, the problem. We have a, a pre-apprenticeship program that's really taken root, um, especially here in the Inland Empire. We have 50 schools that currently uh, carry it. Um, and so pre-apprentice is obviously um, very instrumental in preparing 
tomorrow's workforce for, for the jobs that are going to be out there. Uh, construction is a big part of the Inland Empire. Um, currently, the way that it's uh, um, shaped, though, is a lot of our members within the carpenters find themselves uh, being labeled as super commuters, right? Have to make those long distance drives all the way to LA, San Diego, even Vegas. You know, when, when Vegas is going, a lot of our members are making those commutes. And so, <clears throat> like, like Norma had mentioned, uh, Congresswoman Torres had mentioned, uh, very important um, for those that are in those positions, either within agencies, uh, the cities, the counties, talking about the elected officials, uh, to take the measures to ensure that they're, they're um, ensuring that the community is benefiting from those publicly funded projects. Uh, it builds community wealth and it also ensures that the projects are built that much better, safer, on time, uh, less rework, uh, because you have a skilled and trained workforce that knows what they're doing and they can get the job done safely and on time. Um, <clears throat> in addition to that, uh, it doesn't stop there, um, ensuring that, you know, the private industry, you know, the, the hotels, the, the warehouses, whatever it is, that isn't going to be uh, receiving those public dollars, that the elected officials hold those businesses, those developers to higher standards that, hey, if they want to build in Pomona, if they want to build in San Bernardino, uh, they need to ensure that they're contributing to the generation of community wealth. And it goes beyond just the, the core and shell building or, or the, um, the revenue, the tax revenue that that generates. It needs to go to good paying jobs for the local residents. That's, that's really my solution in my mind is uh, just putting the local residents to work and ensuring that they have the, the skills to do the jobs. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, Stan, do you have anything to add to that? Actually, I pretty much, I will echo much of that. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> it's, it's frustrating for us in labor when we, we, we know what the solutions are, but we have a hard time to uh, actually make it happen. We talk about these uh, commuters who have to travel. Oh, that's because they don't build union in these areas. And so it, 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 just, it, it, it has uh, bad uh, connections with the, uh, uh, the environment, with the, the, the jobs, um, it, it, the economy, the, the money isn't spent in the area. Um, and, and these solutions, the, the solutions are really pretty, uh, uh, to me, they're pretty easy. Uh, it was interesting when we were listening to the early discussion about the economics, uh, and we talked about um, uh, when they were talking about uh, after World War II, the economy really uh, bought, came back really strong, and in a big part because of the uh, infrastructure and the construction, the construction of trades, um, and then that was the highest time of union density. And after that time, those jobs, they started going, trying to destroy union density and the wages went down. And if you look at the overall uh, wealth disparity between the top tier and the bottom tier, and even the middle class, they've been They've been hammered with this stuff. And so we, I think we do have the opportunity to, after World War II, both the United States and ironically, even Germany and France, their economies re rebound. We need to rebound again uh, after, after World War II. So anyways, I, uh, uh, I'll turn it back to you. Great, thank you, Stan. Um, and both for, for Jimmy and Stan, how would um, someone get information about the apprenticeship programs that are available through your unions? Yeah, yeah, thanks for asking. Um, 
I will uh, post it in the, the chat. Um, you know, we have a website that has a lot of information and not on it. And then also I'll post, uh, you know, our closest uh, local, which is uh, local 909's uh, office number uh, to anybody that would like to call in and get more information. Actually, I'll figure out, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit of a Luddite in terms of uh, the technology. Um, I will get that to you also on the IBW. But even beyond that, uh, just a couple of things for people to think about. Uh, there are pre-apprenticeship programs that are not necessarily, and I kind of anal I, I analogize it with uh, dating. You can, uh, a, a pre-apprenticeship program, you might be interested in something, but you're not really wedded to a, a certain uh, tra craft. Um, at that point, then you can apply for a, uh, an apprenticeship program. And at that point, you're kind of engaged because you're going to learning, learn a craft, a specifically craft driven. And then after that, you will be a, a journeyman. Uh, there are a couple of ways to do that. One is go through and, and we will send you the local, for, local 47, but you should be able to look at every uh, craft uh, and maybe we can get it through the building trades, their, their programs. Um, and, and, uh, and all of a sudden my phone, I lost you. Oh, there we are. Um, and then after that, um, uh, you can look at specific employers. For example, Edison, they have their own apprenticeship programs that are direct uh, hires. Cities, they have apprenticeship programs through Usually they're related to the, the craft uh, positions. So there are a lot of different ways to do it. You just need to uh, uh, make the effort to go to all these different options. And we can post some of this information on our website um, associated um, as a link to this uh, webinar. And we're trying to work with the high schools and the middle schools to let our young people know how important these skill trades are. Because I think that re-education you mentioned, young man, about vocational programs not being focused as they were back when I, I came out of the 70s and 80s. So those programs were very relevant and they still are now. We should not be exporting talent. We should develop our own talent. That talent development comes with the apprentice programs along with educating young people that welding, carpentry, uh, construction trades, we have a strong HVAC program with the uh, Chino Valley School District where young folks are coming out in the HVAC program getting jobs great, and are starting their own business program. But these are programs that have skills that you can for a lifetime. Great, thank you all for, for those answers to that question. Um, and I'm gonna actually turn it over to uh, Lance Hastings. Uh, what, or how do we make sure that the manufacturing industry um, has the right people with the necessary skills um, at the right time to do some of these these jobs. Yeah, I mean it's kind of like a um, an assembly line. Uh, you know that you have the future need, and you really need to tool up to make sure that it gets done. And I'm going to echo back again about the Intech Center. If that uh, opportunity could be duplicated, replicated, and relocated mm -hmm. around the regions of the state, we'd be in a much better position to deal with a, a trained workforce uh, for the future. When I did take my role, I, I may have mentioned earlier that one of the, the chief issues that was brought to my attention from our membership was making sure there's employees ready to go. And it's evolved over the course of the last couple of years and even through the pandemic, now to the point where we just need an employee who wants to work, will show up to work and work a, a shift and come back the next day. <laughs> and you sound so basic and, and I, I'm trying not to uh, diminish in any way um, our industry, but that's what it's come to because the supply isn't out there. And some of it sadly has its roots in the narrative of the manufacturing sector that somehow it is not a desirable job for a young Californian to move into the manufacturing sector. And I've heard uh, too many anecdotes of um, uh, when we open our doors on manufacturing day, which is the first Friday in October, where uh, kids, young kids are just wide-eyed in a manufacturing facility, no matter what we're making. It's whether it's pouring molten iron into a form to make pipe, assembling cars. I mean, it, it's a whole gamut of things. The kids are really excited about it. 
And, and too often the parents kind of lean in and say, well, you don't, you don't want to work here. And we're missing out on that opportunity because of the, the economic um, boost that it gives to a, to a person or a family, higher uh, middle-class uh, wages that could buy homes, cars, take families on vacations. That's what we're missing out on. And to the extent that we can make our, our, our work more attractive, I think we'll help close that gap. But as we sit right now, there's one, uh, 1.3 million manufacturing workers in California. There are some pending retirements of a significant degree due to a silver tsunami that's coming up. Um, so we have to have those centers like Intech and others, and even companies like Southern California Edison that do it themselves. The fact remains, we need to make sure that there are opportunities for those who want to get trained to come into the manufacturing sector. And not only is there that training opportunity, but there's a following job opportunity at the end of that work. Lance, um, thank you for bringing that up. I, it, that was you know, the reason why it was so key to have you um, in this discussion because the Intech Center, um, for me, it was critical to bring the labor secretary um, there to see what they are doing, basic skills, an introduction um, to a trade. Uh, we want to uh, you know, build up our manufacturing capacity in the Inland Empire because we know that is a pathway to the middle class. Um, you know, so to the extent mm -hmm. that you can remind, um, you know, your group that the Intech Center is there and they're, you know, ready and able to help train for um, whatever your employers need um, as they look to expanding, you know, their operations in 2021. Um, those are the kinds of jobs that I want to see. I, I want to see trucks come in loaded, but I also want to see trucks leaving loaded with merchandise that is made yeah. not just in America, not just in California, but made right there in the 35th Congressional District. Yeah, if I can make a quick plug, when we did have Labor Secretary Julie Sue there in February, had a great tour, and towards the end, she jumped right in with the welding class threw on the gear and was cutting steel right in front of everybody else. First time ever in her life, but she had the desire just to jump right in to show how uh, important it is. And I think that left a lasting image for the, the 20 or so students that were gathered around. So um, great opportunity. If we could replicate it, fantastic, but we certainly have the need. So thank you for your support. Secretary Acosta was there also a couple of years ago. And unfortunately, you know, he left before um, he can, you know, expand um, that program into other states. I was very, very uh, much looking forward to that. I have a bill here in Congress um, that takes that model um, that we have created locally to the national level. So thank you, Dr. Shannon, for being such a big part of that. Thank you so much. Great. Um, and that actually segues us into um, another topic of discussion. So um, for people to have access to these workforce opportunities, um, these educational opportunities, um, what is being done to improve? We actually have a question here from one of our attendees. What, what can be done or how are we improving transportation to hubs like universities, um, hubs of, of you know, different uh, natures that maybe people need to access these workforce development opportunities and things like that? Public transportation is obviously a key to that. So. Uh, maybe I'll turn it over to one of our transportation representatives. Well, I, to, to perhaps start, um, well, I can't speak to um, Cal State University San Bernardino because that's served by our partner Omnitrans. Um, we're working on a project at Mount San Antonio College that um, is largely funded through a federal discretionary grant, so we're very grateful for that. Um, we're going to build a world-class transit center right at the heart of the Mount SAC campus. We have a, a ridership program with Mount SAC and what we found through that is that that one single university generates 5% of our total system-wide ridership. So it's huge. What we're looking to do next is replicate that partnership with Cal Poly Pomona. And Congresswoman, I'll, I'll forewarn you that we're going to be looking for support for that, but we're, um, we're working with um, um, Dr. Soraya Coley and her team at Cal Poly Pomona on doing something similar. Those then link to our rail programs, our Metrolink and Goldline programs to really create that linkage that the entire region can get to those universities. And it's truly all of us working together that creates access to our universities. 
we need to have even more services and more facilities to, to further enrich that, to really, really make those programs thrive. Great. Uh, Ms. Wiggins, did you have anything to add to that? No, I think Doran said it all. Um, we share the vision and we're working on making sure we can link to all of the colleges, community colleges, um, universities um, to make it more accessible to everybody. Great, thank you. Um, so I think uh, moving on, one of our other questions that uh, were submitted or were submitted during uh, the registration process um, actually centers around unemployment in the Inland Empire. Um, obviously, you know, a lot of people are unemployed in our community. Um, I'm going to turn this over to, to Tim. Uh, Tim, what, uh, you know, what's the state of unemployment in our region and the state and what, what can we expect to see in the next year? You know, how um, can people expect to, you know, return to their their employment and, and have opportunity to, to make, you know, a living wage? You can hear me better if I take myself off mute. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, obviously, a lot of people are hurting badly uh, during these times. Uh, and um, you know, thank Congresswoman Torres for working on getting additional funding uh, for unemployment insurance to California to help people who are, are struggling to find work again. Um, as we talked about, the industries that were hardest hit, uh, retail, hospitality, uh, first hit in the crisis and now hit a second time. Uh, those workers need access to good jobs really quickly. So working with, with Lance and his group uh, and Dr. Shannon uh, and the folks on this call to create pathways into those really good middle-class jobs is what we need to be focused on. That, but those income supports that come with unemployment insurance are critical right now while people search for, for new employment. Um, I will say, because uh, I don't think it's been brought up yet, there are two workforce development boards in the Inland Empire, San Bernardino County uh, and Riverside County. Uh, and I hope that people who are, uh, who are calling in or, or dialing in or, or on the Zoom uh, know where those facilities are, uh, where those offices are, because there you can get access, not just to information about unemployment insurance. Uh, you can get information about uh, what's happening uh, to your claim. Uh, you can also get information about what jobs are available uh, in your community or in the region. Uh, they are working very diligently uh, to serve everybody who most needs uh, needs services uh, right now in these difficult times. Great, thank you for that, Tim. Um, and we'll uh, get the the information for those resources and include those on our website as well for those those workforce development agencies. Um, moving forward, I do want to turn it back over to Dr. Nicholsberg um, to maybe give us a, a little bit more insight into you know what. What public and, and private sector support um, does our region need um, to sort of overcome this economic downturn? You know, what, what can we do on the individual level? What can we do on the government level, um, as well as uh, on the private sector level to overcome um, this, this recession? Sure. So I want to make some comments that, um, that follow on some of the things that Lance and others have said. Uh, there is this narrative that manufacturing left California. And, and in fact, manufacturing has not left California. Uh, in the state of California, more is manufactured today, almost double than what was manufactured in 1990. The difference is that it's advanced manufacturing. It requires different skills. That uh, Rosie the Riveter now needs to be Rosie the robotics technician. And, uh, and, and so there are a couple of things that are true about manufacturing. We've had a lot of discussion over the last few months about onshoring uh, because of the fragile uh, supply chains that have been developed over the last 25 years going deep into Asia. That manufacturing that comes back to the US is gonna be looking for two things. One is land because manufacturing requires land. And that means the inland parts of California including the Inland Empire are, are well suited for that. And the second is they're going to be looking for a skilled workforce. Uh, this is a case where, where the build it and they will come actually is true. That if a pipeline of skilled workers is there, that onshoring manufacturing will come to California. It won't be kind of the differential in taxes. It won't be Texas because it has cheaper labor. It will be California because it has the land, 
in the Inland Empire and other inland parts of the state, and because it has a skilled workforce uh, to supply not initially, but continually that manufacturing activity. So I think that's really where the emphasis should be. That's a growth sector that we see going forward over the next decade. That and technology uh, are the two big growth sectors and uh, pathways that many folks on this call have talked about uh, in terms of workforce development to move individuals to help them move uh, into a position where they can be employed in manufacturing, uh, you know, really is, is a solution for moving from low income jobs to middle income jobs. Thank you for that uh, insight, Dr. Nicholsberg. That's really helpful. Um, one other question we have um, has to do sort of with um, the, the development of, of these, these higher wage jobs. Um, one of our attendees submitted a question and it states, what can be done to develop um, smarter land use with higher, rate, higher rate wage jobs and less damage to our environment and health? So the interplay between obviously higher wage jobs, but you know, also balancing um, you know, health and, and economic needs. So I'm, maybe Tim can answer this, maybe our uh, Dr. Nicholsberg, I'll, I'll let you guys both. I'll defer to Jerry. Go ahead, Jerry. Okay. So I think there's a mythology uh, that comes from certain parts of the political spectrum that there's a trade-off between environmentally sound activities and jobs. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that we teach in Economics 101 is that the efficient allocation of resources, and that means more jobs and higher income jobs, comes when you take uh, pollution and other environmental damage and you internalize it, internalize those costs in the firm. In other words, you, you basically get rid of it and, and, and you produce in an environmentally sound way. So I think in you know, education of the body politic that this is not a trade-off between environmental regulations and good jobs, but in fact, the two go hand in hand you know, is, is important. Um, Dr. Um, Nicholsberg, what I have found um, interesting in my tours um, that I do yearly with local manufacturers is that um, when the question is asked as to where are the materials that they um, utilize to make, you know, whatever it is that they are manufacturing, um, the majority of those small manufacturers are purchasing materials within a 10 mile radius of where their shop is. Um, so I think that, you know, for me, that is the focus of growing those high-tech um, manufacturing jobs because it is a domino effect, you know, one business helping the other in its own neighborhood. And that's how I think that we are going to, you know, eventually get our workforce um, into the middle class. Uh, Congresswoman, I think that's exactly right. It is an entire ecosystem. We just did a, uh, a, a webinar on the Los Angeles aerospace industry. And, you know, is it going, you know, there's always this, is all going to go to Texas? And everyone who was involved in the industry said, no, the workforce is here, the ecosystem is here. Um, I, I took a group back in the days when we could travel, a group of MBAs to China. And, uh, and, we were talking with an American manufacturer in Shanghai who manufactured draperies in China and asking him about the impact of the tariffs. And, and he made the following statement. Uh, yes, I could move to Vietnam and, uh, and, and produce there and get around the tariffs, but there is an ecosystem of suppliers all within a few kilometers of my factory that provide everything that I need. And that's nowhere else. So I just have to pay the tariff. 
So, so I think you're exactly right. It is the development of that ecosystem, that manufacturing ecosystem that is critically important. Uh, that, and that includes the workforce and, and that workforce, some of which will go into uh, primary inputs for the, for the final assembly and final manufacturing. Thank you. Great, thank you, uh, Dr. Nicholsberg again. Um, so we do have a question here um, from one of our audience members um, about veterans. Uh, how are we helping our veterans to, to either pursue education or pursue a workforce development opportunity or an employment opportunity? Um, and I will uh, turn it over to the Congresswoman if you want to uh, touch on, on sort of veterans resources and then we'll let some of the other panelists um, join in as well. Um, absolutely. And if you um, can provide us with um, a contact information, you know, we're happy to send you uh, specific information as to what you need. Um, but in Congress, I introduced a bill um, called the Give Act, which helps veterans um, find the school that is right for them. Um, it creates a database of, um, of schools um, so that you know, veterans that are looking for a specific type of um, um, focus on their education can be matched um, to that university, to that college. Um, I also introduced another bill that would allow um, a veterans to use their GI Bill um, to purchase um, a laptop that they may need, um, you know, to expand the use of the GI Bill so that they're able to buy the supplies that they need uh, for their college. Uh, but send us your information and we're happy to connect you um, with, with those resources. Great. And I think the universities and community colleges are veterans friendly. And I think with support from the Congresswoman and others, we try to make sure that we reach out to veterans. Uh, one of the things that we're doing at Chafee is really looking at uh, expanding our Veterans Resource Center with a new facility. So we're in the process now looking for uh, some capital funds because it is building, they will come. It's important that we reach out to our veterans and all the services as well as their dependents. But we have to make sure as, as you go back into the, after World War II was mentioned earlier, that was a really, really something we did for our veterans. In fact, the community college name came after World War II because it was reaching out to community and the veterans especially. Jimmy, I think you um, wanted to comment on that as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say on behalf of uh, the carpenters, and, and I think it's safe to say on behalf of the rest of the trades within the construction industry, the building trades, um, you know, the Helmets to Hard Hats is a, is a great program um, for the carpenters specifically. We uh, open arm policy for, for vets, especially um, those that are eligible for direct entry if they're um, exiting uh, with uh, honorable discharge, uh, within 18 months of that discharge, they come to us, they have direct entry into our uh, apprenticeship program as a second period apprentice, uh, which is uh, yielding, you know, $22 an hour plus benefits. It's, it's pretty good, uh, pretty good program. Um, also, the uh, military uh, currently has um, the skill bridge program. Uh, that is a program designed, you know, uh, for um, the military personnel that are preparing to transition into the civilian sector. Uh, I think it's 180 days uh, of transition time uh, to train them and gear them for civilian life. And so uh, the carpenters, we, we came up with our own program to implement into that skill bridge. It's called the Stars and Stripes program. Um, and again, it, it creates that direct uh, pathway. It's almost like a pre-apprenticeship program that's um, that will be incorporated into that that skill bridge. Uh, so we're we're very uh, you know passionate about our vets. Great, thank you all for um, providing some information on that front. Um, we have one more question from our audience members. Uh, it has to do with gender diversity um, within apprenticeships. Um, and I'll actually turn this over to Stan. Um, their question is, you know, what, what, is being doing, what is being done on the union front um, to bring more women into the apprenticeship programs and to provide opportunities, um, you know, for, for women and obviously uh, maybe a male dominated uh, or traditionally male dominated field? Can I just say before Stan comes on that I, I was uh, recently 
uh, well, earlier this year before COVID, I, I visited the training center for IBEW. Uh, and I was shocked to see how many women um, they actually have there. Um, so congratulations on that diversity. And, and Stan, you can answer that question better than, than I can. I just know what I saw when I was there. I, I'm very happy about your, your answer. Uh, truth be told, uh, it's, it works out well for us also because there's a lot of uh, women who are very, uh, uh, who will be sk very skilled electricians and linemen. And we are, it's, it's not doing a favor for the women per se, it's doing a favor for the IBW because for all these years, we, a lot of the trades, we didn't have uh, the diversity that we should have and we missed a lot of uh, 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 good employees, employers. So now we go out, we, we make, part of it is just to make people comfortable. Uh, oftentimes women are a little bit apprehensive. Uh, uh, we have tried to make it a lot more uh, uh, inviting for women so that they're not intimidated by the situation because sometimes it can be intimidating for anybody when they're starting in a, in a new job, especially uh, if they don't think that, uh, 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 that they uh, are not welcome, but they absolutely are welcome. We have uh, the, the workers and uh, minority caucus that we try to go out to different schools. We, we have, uh, we invite, we try to advance women goal, uh, not, not only in the trades, but as in uh, reps and uh, uh, move, we, in fact, the IBW, we just had our first uh, woman uh, secretary, uh, vice president uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the history of the IBW. So I'm very proud of, of what we're doing to invite women to be in the IBW. Great. Thank you, Sam. And Jimmy, uh, you wanted something, or you wanted to add something to that? Yeah, you know, I uh, know earlier on I touched upon it within uh, the educational system, right? Um, and, and I think it's also Im important for the educational system to promote that awareness for opportunities within construction, not only to the male students, but to the female students, right? Um, I think uh, that's been something of the past that should stay of the past. And moving forward, you know, break that taboo that construction's for men only. I mean, I, I worked hand in hand with some of the best uh, carpenters in the industry, and they were females. Um, running circles around me, tr truth be told. Um, so, you know, uh, there's plenty of talent to be had uh, within the, the female um, construction workers. And, you know, once again, the carpenters have an open arm policy for anybody, uh, for that matter, regardless of the color of your skin, uh, your sex, or sexual identification. Um, so I just wanted to share that. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, Doran, you had a, a comment as well? Yeah, just along the same line, um, in terms of uh, encouraging diversity, I think transportation is also a, a sector that has often been male dominated and I'm, I'm very honored to be here with my friend and colleague Stephanie Wiggins. I think in the transit space, I know in the transit space we have really leaned in on encouraging diversity and providing opportunities and Stephanie you can correct me if I'm wrong but if the mental math is working I want to say somewhere in the neighborhood of two-thirds of the transit system CEOs that have been appointed in the last year are women and really fabulous talented women and that's the result of a whole number of women that have built those skills to get to that point. So again, I think there are great opportunities in all of these sectors for everyone. And it's really a matter of thinking beyond those traditional stereotypes and taking advantage of, of those great opportunities. Great, thank you, Doran. So I think with that, uh, we are just about out of questions tonight. I know um, it's obviously, we're running a little bit past time. Um, I know David, I think had a 6 a.m. has been going since 6 a.m. So um, I think unless any of our panelists have any other last comments, um, I do want to turn it over to Congresswoman Torres um, to deliver some closing remarks. 
Seeing none, Congresswoman. I was I was already talking without. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, again, I want to thank everyone joining us tonight um, for this opportunity to have this conversation with all of you. Um, thank you um, to all of our speakers uh, that joined us. Um, I want to say that we will beat this uh, uh, virus. Uh, we have one vaccine already, you know, in in our hospitals being uh, um, given to our our medical personnel. We have another one that was just approved. Um, now we have to work on rebuilding our economy in the next year. So that is what we're doing now. I hope that our community will join us uh, in these uh, sessions as we continue to plan them. Um, and again, our community is resilient. We have proved it time and time and time again. And um, we will beat the virus and we will rebuild our economy. Thank you for joining tonight. If you need any more information from our office, reach us at taurus.house.gov or call our phone, um, call us at 909-481-6474. We're here to help you in any way that we can. I know a lot of the requests tonight have been um, about state issues. Um, I, I'm a federal representative but you know, our office is trying to work through some of those state issues that, that you have, whether it's unemployment, um, whether um, it's transportation, local transportation issues, we will try to help you. Reach out and have a good night to everyone. Thank you, Congresswoman. Thank you, Congresswoman. Thank you, everyone.